Well, hello everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to your Critique of the Week. It's Friday, September 8th. So glad you could join me. Let's see, who do we got here? We got Paul Mitchell Bernstein, Dick Westheimer's here, Matt is here. I wonder which Matt that is. Uh, Nate Jacobs here, Dick Westheimer, already said, Sharon Ferrante, good to see you. Buddy Markowski, the first poet we're looking at, is here on YouTube. We got Janthy Rongan. Uh, we've got Katie Dozier. Hey, Katie. We've got uh, Clayton Clark, James Langford, Rose Leonard, uh, Jerry Stephenson's here. Good to see you, Jerry. Let's see. Yeah, good. Mark Grenier's here. Okay, we're on Facebook. Have we got anybody in the house yet? We got Sydney Putnam, Gunterman, Marguerite Doyle, Jenny Middleton. Hello, Tara Meselik McMahon. So good crowd in today as we do a regular critique week, just a traditional version of uh, the broadcast. And the whole point, of course, is to give that workshop experience. So if you're new, you haven't done it before, uh, just leave as many comments as you want on the poems. We're going to try to help out the poets, make the poems as effective as possible. So every poem sort of can maximize the effectiveness of it. And uh, we're going to try to do that um, by sharing what we think, uh, you know, giving actual feedback for uh, what's working for us as strangers confronting the poem for the first time um, like we would in a literary magazine or as the editor going through a submission so we'll see uh we'll see what we can get we have a uh, looks like four really good poems by two poets coming up um why don't we just jump right into it so i haven't read these yet it's gonna be one of those type broadcasts we'll see we'll see what we've got um we're gonna look at bonnie markowski first and uh bonnie mentions um did you have a question hey yeah, just just wants to know how we can make these poems more impactful so that's what bonnie would like to know and let's take a look at her two poems um what the first one we have here is decoration day at yanko's grove so here we go with this uh decoration day at yanko's grove by bonnie markowski uh, maybe i should make this just a little bit well let me make this just a little bit bigger. Um, oops, no, that's not what I want. Where's my zoom? Oh, there's my zoom. Okay. Not that much bigger. Like that much, well, that much bigger. Okay. So we're going to make that a tiny, tiny bit bigger. Okay. So here is uh, Bonnie Markowski's Decoration Day at Yanko's Grove. Behind the silk mill near the calm banks, I walked the railroad tracks home from school every day, ignoring the danger signs, peeking from the overgrowth, bestriding the rails. Find a penny, pick it up, I yelled, careful placing the copper on the track, Lincoln's head up for luck, the stripped out mines beneath haunted holes to hell my grandfather's dug and to then tried, um, and to then tried to crawl out from the rest of their lives. This day, I scrambled home, hoping to be that much closer to Decoration Day, the clam bake respite from the blue-black mouth of the work day, the suffocating schoolroom punishment, the agonizing isolation of home. At Yanko's Grove, watermelons and half-kegs diverted the crick's flow, where my little cousins caught minnows in plastic beer cups. We honored our dead with chickens on a spit. Dago Red, a loud game of canasta, penny a game. Scores would be settled first with Stornelli, then fists, until somebody's rage struck blood. I would run in terror to my mother's stiff white apron. She would shove me out of her way, getting back to the griddle, blistering with popping fat. The pavilion swelled with sounds, half words, Italian English, the slapping of wet bare feet on concrete. So much chaos that I could barely hear the clanging horseshoes hitting their marks. Careless kids playing chase too close. There was safety in this bedlam, where young and old shared something like longing and community. Beneath the birch trees, they would keep our secrets. I wished the day would never end knowing what the silence on the long ride home could mean. Tucked in bed, the yelling got so blistering, I saw the tracks, the penny, hoping the flattened piece of copper would bring me luck before I woke. So that's the first poem we're going to be looking at, and it takes me back right away. Decoration Day at Yanko's Grove. I remember um, uh, my uh, family is the, the Matthews family on my mom's side, and, um, and we had uh, some family reunions there with people, and I just love those, with... Um, um, you know, people you don't, you've never met before, but you're related to some distant way. Um, and it sort of brought me back. It's so similar, uh, experience. Um, 
Yes, D. Coleman says, fantastic imagery. The black, the blue-black mouth of the workday is nice, says Tom Barlow. Yeah, there's a lot to like in this poem. Um, Decoration Day at Yanko's Grove. Let, let's go a little bit, uh, zoom in a little bit. So how do you make it more impactful, was the question. Um, Nate Jacobs says, a great scene setting at Minute. I love the mother's uh, stiff white apron, says Katie. And yeah, those are, those are really nice details. Yeah, and Cindy, too. Cindy Putnam Gunn says, uh, interesting details I like a lot. Um, so it's one of those... Um, um, poems, you know, commemorating an experience and, and, you know, appreciating what we've, what we've experienced and sort of making a record of it, which is a great use of poetry. Um, so decoration day, I'm not sure what decoration day is. I'm going to, I wanted to look that up. Um, decoration day. Um, oh, interesting. Decoration day became Memorial day. Um, why do they call it Decoration Day? John Logan, head of the Grand Army of the Republic, the major Union Army Veterans Association, issued a proclamation um, telling Americans to celebrate Decoration Day. So that was the original one. Then we changed it to Memorial Day. Interesting. I did not know that. Okay, so Decoration Day at Yanko's Grove. Behind the silk mill near the calm banks, I walked the railroad tracks home from school every day, ignoring the danger signs peeking from the overgrowth beside the trails. I think you need a um a comma here just to um there there is ignoring the danger signs peeking from the overgrowth beside stride the rails find a penny pick it up i yelled carefully placing the copper on the track lincoln's head up for luck so so right away we get a nice you know we know where we are even though i, I was ignorant and didn't know what decoration day was but then at yanko's grove is a specific place so we have a time and a place um, and then we get the, all these great details. Um, the silk mill near the calm banks, um, the railroad tracks. Um, really nice start to the poem because we're set right in the scene, as, as other people have already mentioned. Um, stripped out of mines beneath haunted holes. So this, this run, I had trouble. I tripped over while reading it. I'm not sure why these, there are these gaps in the text either. Um, but I tripped over a little bit this, this part. So the stripped out mines beneath haunted holes to hell my grand fair so so it feels like it's missing um i mean, I, I was uh, confused about how to read it. if there's supposed to be a hyphen haunted holes um or if the stripped out mines beneath were haunted is it missing a, a a verb there i'm not sure exactly what's wrong with the sentence the stripped out mines beneath were haunted holes to hell my grandfather's dug into the um dug into and then the dug into Again, I think a comma would help here because it's a separate um, uh, dependent clause. Um, then tried to crawl out from the rest for the rest of their lives. Um, so I think that fixes it up. I think that's the issue. It was just that the, there should have been a verb there. Um, um, anyway, that that's part tripped me up. Or maybe... Um, yeah, so... Um, And here's a point from Mark Grinier, and Katie Dozier agrees. He says, the penny on the tracks, um, although a strong image, does not seem as central to the rest of the poem as it could be. And I was wondering about that. I wonder if I, um, if I missed any detail that maybe makes it make more sense later. Um, and two, SRH says, the form is throwing me off. If I want to keep three line standards, I might strip words from each for more impact. Um, oh, no, the little heart is back. So now I can't read the most recent sentence again. The coal mines were doing the haunting. Um, um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so I'm not sure about this section. That, that's how I would fix it, just to make it more clear. I was a little confused if the whole, yeah, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, and I'm not sure why there's these um, spaces here. I think they just add a little distraction, and I wouldn't bother doing that. Um, let's see. But the stripped up mines beneath were haunted. I think we need that, to, to me. Um, holes to hell my grandfather's dug into, then tried to crawl out from uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, yeah, I thought that's fine. This day I scrambled home, hoping to be the much closer, that much closer to decoration day, the clam bake respite from the blue-black mouth of the work day, the suffocating schoolroom punishment, the agonizing isolation of home. So we have a we have a lot of good, um, yeah, 
And, and so Dick Westheimer says, yes, I find missing words and punctuation as I read through my poems, which is why I read them aloud in different voices to try to trip myself up. Yeah, that's a good, it's a really great practice too. One of the things I like to do is read, you know, I'm terrible with accents and I would never do it on video. <laughs> but I try to read things sometimes in different accents, like a terrible Southern accent or a British accent or an Australian accent or whatever, just to sort of see how it feels in someone else's mouth, maybe. And that's a really a nice thing to do. I mean, a lot of times I do it in my head without, without subjecting the external world to it. But um, but I think that's a, that's a good a good thing to do with your poems. And not only for that, but just to hear hear how the words play together in different ways that people would be interpreting it, kind of. Um, but anyway, um, Jerry Steffen says, holes to hell is a good line from mining towns. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, where were we? The day, let's see. So, so we're going to keep an eye out though, for how the tracks play in. Cause I was wondering, it, it felt a little out of place to me too. Um, it, it felt like it, it was sort of a run up to the poem that wasn't really necessary. And I wonder if maybe cutting that can help, but maybe I missed something too, where it fits better. So we're going to keep, keep thinking about that. Um, but, but so, so, cause as we have as so far, the whole poem is this, all it really is a lead up to how excited I am for decoration day. The whole first three stanzas, which is a really slow build up for, for how much payoff kind of there is in a poem. It's a poem that, that brings up this memory. Um, but there's a lot of lead up to just that memory. And so it, it has a bit of a, a slow lead up in the arc. Um, anyway, um, this day I scrambled home, hoping to be that much closer to decoration day, the clam bake respite from the blue black mouth of the work day the suffocating schoolroom punishment the agonizing isolation of home so we get a lot of background details there that that sort of connect you to the, to the speaker at yanko's grove and again i wouldn't do this just because unless there's a really good reason for these extra breaks it just distracts at yanko's grove watermelons and half kegs diverted the crick's flow um <laughs> nate jacobs says do not turn this into a high bend uh, there's some talk about the crick and i think um you know, crick instead of creek is an interesting sort of vernacular, but but with a C R I K, I think that's a little um, distracting. Now, I guess maybe it's there. So it says an obsolete spelling. So it's actually was spelled as crick like this before. Other some people are mentioning maybe putting a C another C in there. So C R I um, C K. But according to uh, Wiktionary, um, that is an old spelling of creek. So that's interesting. Okay. Learned a couple things already today. Um, diverted the crick's flow where my little cousins, and, and of course, too, using an obsolete spelling in that vernacular sort of sets you back into the environment you're going into. So as long as that's an accurate thing, I think that works well. Um, where my little cousins caught minnows in plastic beer cups. Again, great details, like not just plastic, not just cups, but plastic cups and not just plastic cups, but plastic beer cups. So we get that, all that detail there. Uh, we honored our dad with chickens on a spit. Dago read a loud game of canasta, penny a game. Scores would be settled first with Stornelli, then fists until somebody's rage struck blood. I would run in terror to my mother's stiff white apron. Again, the stiff white apron. These great details. And you can see how much details bring a story to life. Um, it's that specificity, you know. And we talk about this a lot of times, but a lot of people think early on in their writing that, you know, maybe my, you know, your grandmother, the reader, you had a blue apron, so I shouldn't say it was white. But that specificity is what makes us actually connect to it. So it's a good example of that. Um, she would shove me out of her way, getting back to the griddle, blistering with popping fat. The pavilion swelled with sounds, half words, Italian English, the slapping of wet bare feet on concrete, so much chaos that I could barely hear the clanging horseshoes hitting their marks. Just this whole run where we really get into the scene is just wonderful and it's so vivid and brings the whole thing to life. I, I just love it. Oops, I didn't mean to do that though. Um, careless kids playing chase too close. And you can see I had some problems with the, you know, a few places with the, the syntax and, and the reading it. But then once you really get into the poem um, and when those details are sort of singing, the poem singing too, because it's coming from this sort of deeper place that's less conscious of itself. Um, but anyway, um, where were we? Blood, run, terror. Yeah. Uh, smashing chaos. I could barely hear the clanging horseshoes hitting their marks. Careless kids playing chase too close. There was safety in this bedlam where young and old shared something like longing in community beneath the birch trees that would keep our secrets. I wished the day would never end knowing what the silence and long ride home could mean. Tucked in bed, the yelling got so blistering. I saw the tracks the penny hoping the flattened piece of copper would bring me luck before I woke. And so the, 
So what we have here um, is is the the uh, copper up here that we left for luck, sort of being a frame for the poem. And um, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. It feels a little. It, it takes us out of the poem in a way that I wonder if. Um, hmm. I wonder if we could, if, if the poem would be stronger by getting rid of that. It, it, it is. It's like a, the frame on a, on a canvas, which is a nice, a lot of times having a separate frame um, provides a certain perspective that adds a lot more, a lot of detail to the poem or a lot of, um, you know, like layers of meaning to it. And um, I'm not sure this really goes together as well. And I wonder, so, so with this, um, what, what this, what this preamble kind of got us was um the sense that um it was a respite i mean that's kind of the key word from this whole beginning and then at the end with the the coin it's like the respite is over and so that's kind of the frame that we use it's like this this penny um and the, the idea of it being put on the tracks for luck is a way of um um getting that point across and and that's sort of but but it seems to me um the poem might work better if we jumped right into the grove um, and and then got that because so many people were talking already and, and I agree um, about um, using, um, you know, having a sense, let me see who is saying it. Yeah. So, so another poet is saying a lot of lead up with no payoff. Um, and yeah. And so Nate Jacob says the balance and the nostalgia between comfort and violence is a fantastic exploration. I really want to feel more tension between the two, though. Uh, but good bones here. Um, and, but where was the, someone was saying, uh, there needs more of a turn. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so this was Nate Jacob. He says, something within the images needs to lead to change and feel or a switch of direction. It takes me where I thought it would from the start, but I'm looking for some more surprise. And that, so that's what I'm getting at. So I think if we got rid of this sort of introductive preamble and jumped in later in the poem, um, um, you know, and we could just start, I scrambled home hoping uh, to be that much closer to decoration. We could jump in right there and you cut all this and then have this sense of, um, you know, the, the hell of the history, the, um, that could be on the way home. And so if we started with the, the sort of the joy of being excited for decoration day and we're going there and all this stuff is happening, but with a sort of dark tinge to it, which we have, you know, there's certain, the fights and stuff that go on in here. Um, and then on the ride home, we realize what we're going home to. And, and, and then maybe on, on the ride home, you know, the way home through the tracks, maybe we, we think about the hell that our grandfather's you know, dug out of, and then like, I'm digging out of this hell too at home, you know? And so that can be the transition. If we don't have this preamble, we jump right into the decoration day, then that can, that sort of stuff can go at the end where it feels like a more of a sense of movement and we get to connect more. And because a poem, we talk about this all the time is a transformative experience. It has to, has to go from some transformation it has to be from one state to another state to feel that sense of movement, like a plot, the same way a story does. Um, and so, and that's the kind of element that it's missing. And I think just rearranging the details like that would, uh, would be the thing to improve it. Um, and, and that's the main thing with the poem. I think you know, having it be more impactful, that's the way to make it more impactful. Um, so, so that's what I would recommend for this poem. Another detail, um, which I noticed as well, um, well, where'd it go? Um, ah, okay. <laughs> um, there are a few... Let's see. Yeah. Um, so, so Paul Mitchell Burns says the language is pretty impactful already. Hold a hell, popping, cracking, bedlam. Um, I think the way to make it more impactful would have to do with formatting. And I think maybe that's what he's talking about. Um, let's see. There was another comment I was going to mention, though, too. Where'd it go?
Um, so, uh, J.D. Middleton said, I think the poem is both about remembering the history of a place and its people and about a personal experience. I think there maybe needs to be more about the narrator's present situation. Yeah, and so that's what I was kind of getting at, is that, um, you know, what do you get back to? You know, like like that sense of like, this is the, the broader thing. But then when this day is over, I'm coming back to this very personal situation and, and getting it that um, on the way home, I think, is the way to make it a kind of a journey of a poem. Um, Tara McMahon says, I love the blue black um, Robert Hayden in those winter Sundays, but I feel I hear it too much in poems. Tim, what is your wonderful um, what is your view of wonderful compound adjectives or noun for that matter? that seem to be used over and over again by so many poets. Yeah, they're true. Um, you know, blue-black doesn't strike me um, as something that's overused too much. Um, um, but there are phrases that, that you hear. Um, they're sort of like poet cliches. And I always warn people about that just because they don't have as much impact. Is it, They're sort of not quite they're really cliches because you only see those phrases in poems and people were, care about language and try to make language interesting. Um, but... Um, you know, so, so having really unique imagery is, is important, you know, cause it stimulates the brain more, fires up your synapses even more. So, um, yeah, so I agree with that, but, but if, to me that that's not one that's too, that's not reaching the level of a poet cliche yet. Um, let's see. Um, SRH says the problem with the crick vernacular is it's only used once. If regional vernacular is used, use it throughout to make it more authentic. And yeah, that's a good point too. Um, if you, if there are other places you could, um, where it fits, definitely, um, you know, use it more. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's enough uh, for that poem. Let's go on to the other poem um, by Bonnie. And this is Lost. Um, one small beer, and I remember how lost my father, or sorry, one small beer, and I remember how I lost my father in a swamp near the river where he used to fish, bring the perch home, stuff it, fat with clumps of mud, caked memories. I thought it would be like it was with his father. He would die in my house of old age in the small halfway hallway between the living room and the kitchen. Um... I mean, let me read again. He would die in my house of old age in the small hallway between the living room and the kitchen contended, contented, shuffling his way, uh, way to fry an egg sandwich drowned in olive oil. I think this would be contented, which is what threw me off, right? Um, maybe, maybe not. Right, we'll go back to it. He got lost, but he got lost. Drowned his brain before his body had a chance to die. Now he wanes high on the crest of a valley, of mortality, of absurdity. Henry, the imaginary cat, lets us know when he's gone, licks his shadowy whiskers and purrs in the dark, looking for the light that used to shine in father's eyes. So this shift to Henry's cat, I really like this ending. Or I mean, the, the, you know, that last stanza is really nice. Um, lost. Let's take a, let's take a closer look at it. Lost. So one small beard, I remember how I lost my father in a swamp near the river where he used to cat to, used to fish, uh, bring the perch home, stuff it fat with clumps of mud, caked memories. And of course, the should be a hyphen, mud caked memories. I thought it would be like this with his father. I don't think this is a comma, unnecessary comma. I thought it would be like this with his father. He would die. Or I thought, sorry, I thought it would be like it was with his father. He would die in my house of old age in the small hallway between the living room and the kitchen. Um, yeah, contented? I'm not, I'm not sure. I think that's supposed to be contented. But I, I'm not sure if I'm translating it right. In, in which case, there should be a comma there because um, that's a modification. Um, in the kitchen, contented, shuffling his way to fry an egg sandwich drowned in olive oil. But he got lost. Um, so, so for this one, I, I like this, this different conceptions of loss. There, there's a sense of, um, um, inconsistency in the way the poem is presented though, um, which I think could be tightened up, uh, for one thing. Yeah. D. Coleman of this says, uh, could do without either. And I think that's true. I don't know if we even need that. Um, we could just do that. Um, cause we, you know, anytime you can... Um, let the reader supply the interpretation 
um, then the, then it, we feel it more strongly. You know, if we get to participate in that in the poem that way, then we feel better. We feel more connected to it by having it be like a two way street. So if you did, so anytime you could avoid saying something like that, it's much much better. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, and SRH says the one small beer too. That was the thing I was was thinking about. I'm not sure how, you know, why is it one small beer? Um, and that plays into the, you know, the drowned in his brain before his body that we get later. Um, yeah, Dick Westheimer says I work on what my wife calls mouthful constructions. It was with, it would be like, yeah. Um, yeah. So let me see an example of that. Um, Where is that? How I lost my father in a swamp near the river where he used to fish. Bring the perch home. Um, let's see. Yeah. Well, everybody's all over the place. So, so um, which one to address first? So the contrast between the energy of the deck. This is Mark Grinier. The contrast between the energy of the Decoration Day celebration and the tension. Oh, is he behind? Okay. Yeah, so that was the last poem. So, so other people are talking about why, why a small beer. Um, Jerry Stephens says, "Why a small beer? Lost father, drowned, too much space in tail." Um, yeah, and and so so I feel like there's there's a few things going on here. There's a lot more that could be said in this poem, um, but there's enough said that it feels like um, you know we could either condense it. Or we could expand it. It's sort of in this limbo in between. And, and I think that's the reason why there's this inconsistency, inconsistency I mentioned in the stanzas. And to me, I think um, I would condense this into a much shorter poem. Um, and and so just move through these three. Really, we have three. We have me getting lost in the swamp. We have the um, grandfather, you know, drunk and, and confused in the house. And then we have the, the cat. And I think you could, I think this is the tightest, best stanza. And I think you could make three stanzas about the size and consistency and then have the, or at least this length and maybe stretch them out more, you know, with long, with shorter lines too, even. But, um, but have um, the poem have a lot more balance by that and, and tightening it to be more impactful. Um, Mark Junior says the second from the last stanza is weakest to abstract and needs images, maybe from unsuccessful fishing trips. Yeah, so so let's do let's see what we could do. I think this is a poem where we could trim back into a short, tight, condensed poem and make it really work. So um, um, so let's let's try it. One small beer, and I remember how I lost my father in a swamp. Um, let's see. See the fat with clumps of mud and mud or. Er, Fat with clumps of mud caked memories, is a real the, the the clumps of mud cake is in detail, but then it becomes a real weird abstraction with memories. Um, so I think um, we don't need that. That doesn't really add anything to the actual story itself. Um, let's see. Um. What if it was like um, how I lost my father in a swamp near the river where we used to fish? Um, like like mud caked perch or something like that? Um, Tom Barlow says, don't understand stuffing perch. Those for laser tiny. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, I think the first line, one small beer and I remember how I lost my father in a swamp. And then I think we need a little bit of that story, um, which we don't quite have. So maybe it's not the kind of thing where I can just dissect the poem apart because we need a little bit of like how I got lost. Um, and it's not quite there. Like, like, like with the, with the clumps of mud caked, that, that, that image is my, are my feet there? Are my feet mud caked? Um, you know, is there something else going on there? I'm, I'm not so. So, um, um, yeah. Okay. So, so I think you know. I think I'm going to cut this, but but 
use that and, and expand a little bit like right here. Because I think we need a little bit more. We need a little bit more of this story. So a little more right there. Um, I thought it would be like it was with his father, how he would die in my house of old age. Um, in the small hallway between the living room and the kitchen, shuffling his way to fry an egg sandwich. I think we don't need to drown in olive oil. Um, um, yeah, and so and then this this section here is really abstract, as uh, Mark Grinier points out. So I think we want to cut that. So what I want is one small bee, and I remember how I lost my father in a swamp. Um, and then some detail from that being lost. Like, as yeah, just now, um, SR8 says, I'd like to hear about the swamp. Like, that's a real missing hole in the poem. You know, th there could be great details. What was it like to be lost in a swamp? Um, you know, were, were you worried about, like, gators and snakes? And, you know, how dirty was it? What was it? Was the ex what did it feel like? Was it cold? Was it warm? You know, what, just that experience deserves a few lines. And then using that somehow to transition to the grandfather... Because it is. Someone said there was confusion between the father and the grandfather. It was, um, um, you know, it's his father. So it's the grandfather here that was dying in, uh, in my house. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so somehow, and then some transition, which this doesn't really make sense. But then some transition into here. Um, you know, like like that situation reminds me of my grandfather dying in the house. Um, you know, something like that. Um, in the small hallway between the living room and the kitchen, shuffling his way to fry an egg sandwich, but he got lost. Um, drowned his brain before his body had a chance to die. And so just sort of tightening up that I would do. And then, and then somehow a transition to the cat. Like if we just had this tight poem where we move from this one image, th this one little story, um, you know, I could see it working. It just needs this sort of connective tissue and a tightening. Um, but, but, you know, being lost in the swamp, how am I lost? You know, what was it like? How that reminds me of my grandfather. And then, and then how you can get to the cat and have it be, you know, a tightened up thing. Yeah. Um, What, Wayne's on the crest? What's the... Hmm? I'm not sure what he's saying. He wants to bring... Uh, <laughs> SRH wants something back, but I'm not sure what. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, the imaginary cat. Like, so there's just... There's these things that relate, and they're just not connected yet. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so this is a, this is a poem that, that needs connective tissue, mostly. Um, okay, so so I think that's what what I work on. So these are poems that have a lot of great detail, um, and just could use some restructuring, um, and, and it's restructuring in different ways. This one is, I think, a really easy edit. Decoration at Yanko's grave, because we just move up this, you know, the the idea of coming home, you know, making an idea of coming home. Then we have this sense of movement, and then this one is more, you know, the story's just not completely told. Like we don't have, we don't know why it's an imaginary cat. And we don't get the story of being lost in the swamp or how the three connect. And so I think it's a great way. So let me read the last stanza, though. It's its own thing. Henry, the imaginary cat, lets us know when he's gone. He licks his shadowy whiskers and purrs in the dark, looking for the light that used to shine in my father's eyes. It's a very nice ending. Uh, so if we can find a way to get to transition from these through these two stories to the cat, I think it's great. Yeah, Deb T says, I love Henry, the imaginary cat. So it's just a matter of that. Um... Yeah. Oh, so he wants the. Um, oh, SRH says the the vitality, the mortality of, of absurdity, and wanes on the crest. So now he wanes high on the crest of of a valley of mortality of absurdity, and and that was a section that and I think this this of mortality of absurdity is, is too abstract to really mean a whole lot. Um, yeah. So, so there's a lot more that can be done with this poem. I think it's a very, it's one of those poems where you can feel sort of a deep kernel of truth underneath, but it hasn't been exposed or hasn't been really found itself yet. So I think we need more, a lot more detail. 
um, and a lot more connective tissue. So let's move on to the other Pope. There, thanks for sharing these, Bonnie. They're really great details in them. They're, they both conjure scenes really well. Uh, I enjoyed them. Let's go to um, the other poem now, or poet, I should say, which is Patrick Wilcox. And um, Patrick had, let me switch. Uh, yeah, here's Patrick Wilcox. And this is, I don't recognize our neighborhood anymore. Again, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so it's a little bigger for you. Maybe that much. Um, and then Patrick asks, um, in general, um, I wonder if these poems are dynamic enough. Do they move through different emotional spaces? Do they surprise the reader from beginning to end? Thanks. So those are great questions because that's always something, you know, we talked about it with the last poem too. So that's that's something poems have to find a way to do. I and mean, that's kind of the, the point of poems. So let's see if, uh, let's see how Patrick does it. First, I don't recognize our neighborhood anymore. A patchwork quilt of green and gold, trash tumbling, then settling on the curb. A car parked for months on the side of the street. Kickball until dark, ghostman on third. Thunder carves through midnight's quiet. A pile of glass where a car once was. Every storm tears down a tree limb or two. A dog runs loose through ruptured morning. This new sun, unbearably, unbearably light, clouds in the shape of words we don't say anymore. Every day scabs over, sunsetting our memory. This is our language of letting go, once young. Each moon is a moment, a secret that doesn't want to be a secret. And even though you don't know, you know. You will pack a small bag and almost leave for good this time. You know what you don't know. You just need to hear it for once from me. Um, so another great, there's a great um, a sense of language in this poem. There's a music to it all. It was very fun to read out loud. It worked well. Um, one of the things, um, this is a really a, a close detail we hardly ever talk about. Um, but, the, but it's something that when the poem is, is working on sort of levels of detail and imagery and creating a space and having a, a voice to it, one of the things that is like sort of far down the list of things to worry about, but is nice to be aware of, is the sense of the length of the sentences and, and varying that and how much sort of tension and energy that can create. And one of the things I noticed as I was reading this poem is that there's this sense that each sentence is about the same length. So it has this very um, and unsurprising, it's almost like, um, you know, how like, like a sing songy type verse, um, but, on, but in the level of the syntax. Um, so a patchwork quilt of green and gold, trash tumbling and settling on the curb, a car parked for months on the side of the street. You see how those are all like the same length? And it just goes on like that. Kickball until dark, ghostman on third, thunder carves through midnight's quiet, a pile of grass where a car once was, every storm tears down a tree limb. Or so it just keeps going and going and going. And it, I'm always waiting for it to like break out of that. Because when you do break out of that, you, we get sort of a little, a little thrill, a little feeling of energy, of a, a sense of that of transition and that, um, you know, that, that friction that makes heat and makes things glow, you know, there's something in it that in changing up your expectations and it's sort of weirdly never fulfilled. And I don't see any reason to not do that. So we keep going through at this pace, but I think, you know, if we find the right place to connect and link sentences together, um, it creates, it helps the poem a lot, have a lot more energy. Um, so, you know, a dog runs loose through ruptured morning, this new sun, unbearably light, clouds in the shape of words we don't say anymore. So these are nice lines. I love clouds in the shape of words we don't say anymore. They're just beautiful lines in the poem, but they're very isolate. Um, and I think it would be uh, the great, the best poet I can think of who does this um, is, um, is um, Alan Shapiro. I love the way Alan Shapiro's sentences move. Um, I wonder if I could think of a good example um, but I always think of him as like the master of syntax. And I really should have him on the Rattlecast. He hasn't been in Rattle in a long time, though. Um, let's see. What, let me think of a poem. I'm looking through his, his poems right now over here from the... Um, well, let me just show you this. So the, the variation of this, uh, these lines right here. This is a gas station restroom. It's from his book... Um, um, I'm drawing a blank. It's like the night, night of the Republic. And so he's go through this sort of emptiness of, of different locations around his town. 
presumably as he's like walking at night and it makes you wonder like why he's walking and looking at these things at night you know what kind of emptiness is he feeling even though he never mentions it which is a really cool book but anyway gas station restroom the present tense is the body's past tense here hence the ghost sludge of hands and the now gray strip of towel hanging limp from the jam dispenser hence the mirror squinting through grime at grime at the worn to a silver of a soiled soap on the soiled sink. So that is one sentence you know, connected with um, a semicolon. And it's almost a random poem that I picked. I just knew which book it was from so I could say which one. But, um, uh, but, but see how, that, how, how many times that weaves in and out of that sentence. Um, the streaked bowl, the sticky toilet seat, air claustral with sink, all residues and traces of, of the ancestral spirit of body free of spirit, hence behind the station at the back end of the store, hidden away and dimly lit this cramped and solitary carnival inversion, Paul becoming Saul, becoming sense synonymous and animal, hence the in, over the insides of the lockless stall, the cave-like scribblings and glyphs declaring unto all who come to it in time, heaven is here at hand and dark and hell is orderless, Hell is bright and clean. And so that whole thing is two sentences. Um, and we use so many ways of linking and stretching. We have the, the, um, the hyphened off uh, or dashed off a side here. We have the, um, uh, you know, the semicolons we mentioned and this repetition of hence, you know, to, to sort of string sentences along. And there's so many ways you can play with connecting sentences that are really worth doing. And that's one of the things on a, on a sort of a, you know, next level up level that distinguishes a really great poet from, um, you know, a lesser poet is the way, the variation in the syntax and just the way that we play with language. Um, and I think a lot of people don't even notice that um, on at least a conscious level. It's not something we talk much about in, um, in um, you know, like, like MFA programs and classes and stuff, like at, at that detail. But if you were to diagram these sentences out, they're so complex. And that complexity adds just such a richness in it to the experience. And so, you know, the images and the lines are great in this poem um, by Patrick Wilcox. I love a lot of it. Um, but the, the repetition of the syntax, um, you know, it, is a detracting um, aspect to me because it, it starts to feel repetitive. Um, and so even though the lines are great, like think about how we could connect these and, and shift these around and use you know, other forms of punctuation or just stretching sentences, um, you know, by compounding them. Um, so even if you had like, um, well, let's read through and I'll do a couple. Um, so every storm tears down a tree limb or two, you know, even, you know, so even if we had like this, if we just, you know, delete the period. Um, and a dog runs. So if we had, so see how much better that feels, just that tiny slip. So a pile of glass where a car once was. Every storm tears down a tree limb or two, and a dog runs loose through ruptured morning. This new sun unbearably light. See that just that and right there stretches this sentence longer, which makes the the short senses around it stronger. And so there's a way that that variety um, really helps with the way the poem is going. Or, or with the way the poem's landing, I guess I should say. Um, um, and if we could do like, um, you know, this new sun, unbearably light. Um, let's see. If we dash that off. Uh, like this, something like that. Um The new sun on barely light scabs over the day. So we have that, you know, that would be the sentence. Sun setting our memory. So that would be the sentence. But then we have this, this, um, parent, this um, dashed aside in the middle. So this new sun, unbearably light, clouds in the shape of words we don't say anymore, scabs over the day, sun setting our memory. So, you know, that has so much texture. It's almost like a texture do you think of you know if you it's, it's almost you know it's really similar to again you know talking about food which i didn't never paid too much attention to uh but but katie being into food you know we talk about umami and things i don't know what that is <laughs> or i didn't and, you know but but uh you know we think about like the the color palette of the presentation the different taste you know the tastes and the way they mingle but the texture is another aspect of food 
And so many things, you know, just aren't as good. Like a sandwich needs something with like some crunch in it too, you know, or, or a wrap or something, so, you know. And so having those different textures within within some kind of dish is really important to food. And it's the same way with the syntax. It adds a texture element to the poem. So that's just something I always... um we haven't really talked about, I don't know. I mean, it, it, you know, five years. I don't know if I've ever talked about that detail. Maybe I have a few times. Um, but I thought that was a great place to point it out. Just because the poem is so beautifully written, but also um, monotonous on the syntactic level. So it's such an easy thing to change. Just link these sentences together in a way that, that works more. Um, but anyway, so let's, let's ignore that aspect of it now that we've played with it some. And you, know, and, and you do that in places where you want people to notice more. Um, you know, there's another way, you know, we expect things and so see if you weren't paying that much attention that that gap you know is something where it shifted the um your perception and if you're daydreaming it locks you back into focus and anytime you shift the syntax or add some kind of gap or anything change the way you speak like that shift locks the focus in the reader back and so you want to do that you want to make those shifts in important moments in the poem you know because we start to sort of our mind starts to wander when we read and and having that variation a sudden shift in the way that the sentences are structured is a way to snap the reader's attention back into focus so so pick way pick places where it's more meaningful and you can do that in a way that sort of stretches and, and, and manipulates the attention of the person reading the poem um that's something to, to to consider but enough of that let's look at the poem on an individual level because i've been sort of yeah, it was a real tangent um and um but anyway but it was an important tangent it's like the next it's a thing you know higher up um yeah. So Matt says, I love that change, although now the sun is sunsetting. Yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm not even thinking about the, the, um, the actual like meaning of the words themselves. I'm just thinking like just, just varying the syntax and how you can play with the way the sentences are connected. Um, so aside from me, and I think I should revert <laughs> to the original version as we talk about it. Um, so those are just examples of what the kind of thing I'd like to see done in this poem. But now let's look at it on a, um, yeah, so, so Rose Denard says the disjointed sentences do give the sense of looking around at the neighborhood and seeing all um, of these different discrete scenes. And yeah, that's true. So, and so having these sort of, um, you know, sprinkled throughout is a good thing. You know, that's part of the variety is having these short disjointed sentences. But then it just at some point it becomes monotonous. And so that's a thing to um, to uh, to focus on. So anyway, let's let's look at the poem in a more holistic, like this is a poem, you know, what it's about way. I don't recognize our neighborhood anymore. Again, a patchwork of quilt, a patchwork quilt of green and gold. So beautiful start, trash tumbling, then settling on the curb. A car parked for months in the side of the street. Kickball until dark, ghostman on third. So this is right around the time where I would start varying that structure. Um, thunder, so, so you get that sense of like looking around and, and sort of, taking in one thing at a time. But once that sense is established, I think you want to transition out of it and, and break up your expectation to just keep the poem engaging. Anyway, I said I wasn't going to talk about that anymore, but it's important. It's important to describe. Anyway, a pile of glass where a car once was. Every storm tears down a tree limb or two. A dog runs loose through ruptured morning. This new sun unbearably light. Clouds in the shape of words we don't say anymore. Again, I think this is such a great line. That, that we don't say anymore is a sense of transition. So, you know, we get these details, which is looking out. And then it's the first time we become sort of emotionally present, like we, the speaker, um, you know, we, the participant in the poem. Um, Every day scabs over, sunsetting our memory. This is our language of letting go once young. Each moon is a moment, a secret that doesn't want to be a secret. And even though you don't know, you know. Well, and this is a, a dangerous kind of thing to do in a poem because I don't know. I'm not quite following. <laughs> and even though I don't know, you know, but I don't really know. Um, you will pack a small bag and almost leave for the good this time. And so the you, so we talk about you. Um, you know, we have the we up here. It introduces, um, where was that? You know, we don't say anymore. Why isn't that you? So there's a shift from the third person to the second. And it's not saying that, that you can't do that, but it leaves us a little um, lost, you know? 
um, as to who, you know, who is actually speaking and who are we, you know, who's the subject of the poem. Um, anyway, you will pack a small bag and almost leave for good this time. You know what you don't know. You just need to hear it for once from me. And who's me? So I feel, I feel very lost with these transitions from the we to the you to the me. Um, yeah. Each moon is a moment, a secret that doesn't want to be a secret. And even though you don't know, you know. You will pack a small bag and almost leave. Um... Yeah, Nick Jacobs says, you know, should be followed by a dash or colon, so the next line is what is known or unknown. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, yeah. So so I expect some kind of resolution here. I'm not getting it. Um, and, and that's the thing. I'm just kind of lost at the end. I love the way the scene lays out. I think so. to me, I, it's something someone is thinking about leaving like a marriage. Um, that's the way that I interpret it. I don't recognize it. And that's where the R, and it gets back into the we don't say anymore, like the, the way that, you know, a relationship people grow apart. And that's why we don't, I don't recognize our neighborhood. It's not my neighborhood. Um, and so I think that's what it's getting at. But I think is the you, it's, it's, it's hard to piece the whole thing together. And as Dick Westheimer says, really puts it well, the whole section seemed to be avoiding the whole possibility for the poem confronting, discovering what's going on. Yeah. I mean, it's like the, yeah. And then, uh, and SRH mentions this too, which is a separate point. Um, but this is something I recommend not doing like ever, um, which is a rare thing I say, but this, I call it a, the step down line. And, um, you know, just from an editor's perspective, and, and SRH points out, I don't like the last three-line layout. This is sort of a, we talked about poets' cliches before with that blue-black um, light. Um, this is sort of a, a way for the formatting to, to stand in for emotional impact that you see people doing in a lot of bad poems. Like this poem is just way better than having a step-down ending. But you see a lot of poems that end that way that, you know, I am falling, you know, and it's like you're supposed to read that with such emphasis because it's like this, you know, this sort of impact. And, and you know, it, it I think it, it's a melodrama on like a layout level. And so, you know, have the have the words. We want to be creating this sort of world of words that's like a magic space that's passing my feeling on to you. And we don't want to be thinking about the way it's laid out on the page. Um you know, the way that it's laid on the page is like a way to teach us how to read it and experience it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so anyway, so it's a, it's a minor point, but, but this is something to avoid. Because if I see if I see out of the corner of my eye a poem that does that, I'm going to assume as an editor it's a, it's a crap poem, to be honest. And, and this is not you know um and i wouldn't like you know dissuade the poem from you know if the if the poet's great and it does that like fine um but it's something that um is a sign that the poem's not it's the same thing as if it was like in uh, comic sans font or something so so that's something to avoid i think um yeah and i mean you mean just because even just closing it up and letting it be its own line, um, you just need to, need to hear it once from me. You know that's under that's under that's letting us sort of supply the drama in that line, um, and so so it just works better that way. So so it's a tiny thing, but but definitely. Um, okay. Um, Let's see. So, anyway, but the main thing, and these are just small details. Uh, they're the great images throughout. The SRA says the patchwork quilt, and, and it is true. A, a patchwork quilt, I think it's the only line. It's the weakest of the descriptions. It's a bit of um, one of those, you know, poetry cliche type things we talked about with the blue black again. Um, you know, a patchwork quilt is just a phrase you see a lot in poems, but not anywhere else. Um, just having, having something be a quilt is something we kind of see a lot. And it's, it doesn't, it, it's such a, 
it's a it's okay but it doesn't live up to the rest of the lines because the rest of the lines are great in their detail and specificity trash tumbling then settling on the curb a car parked for months on the side of the street kickball until dark ghost man on third i love the ghost man on third too that's a really nice um you know, transition to sort of a specific detail from like this broader view which is nice um and so um yeah, so SRH says just to start with the trash tumbling, then settling on the curb. Um, and in green and gold is a bit, too, because of the frost poem. You know, the um, you know, tones of green and gold. Um, so so I, I do agree that starting just with the trash tumbling is a better, a better start. Um, a car parks for months on the street, on the side of the street. Um... Kickball into dark, ghost on third, thunder carves through midnight's quiet. Well, if thunder carves through midnight's quiet is nice too. A pile of gra- glass where a car once was. Well, that's great too. Every storm tears down a tree limb or two. A dog runs loose through ruptured morning. The new sun unbearably light. Clouds in the shape of words we don't say anymore. Every day scabs over, sun setting our memory. This is our language of letting go. I don't understand the once young either. Someone mentioned, is it an Alzheimer's poem? I don't think, that's not my interpretation. Um, and, and and that, I think, is the line that maybe implies it, but I don't think so. I think that it's implying a, a longer relationship that's being, that's, that's sort of past its prime. Um, but But it's a little, it throws me off a little bit. And I think it's better without that line too. It's sort of a false lead. Each moon is a moment, a secret that doesn't want to be a secret. And even though you don't know, you know. So I think this is where it goes astray. It doesn't want to, um, you know, tell the story it wants to tell, which is always a problem with the poem. Um, but I mean, what if the poem? What if it just ended like this? Let's. I'm gonna just for in a. Um, what if we did this? What if we just deleted this whole you don't you know you do thing and and it was more of a um we did this and we got rid of um this too this whole thing is like a way of distancing ourselves from the poem what if we went like this let me just read the poem in this length like this we got rid of that first line which is weakest of the lists which shortens the the feeling of the list being repeated so i don't recognize our neighborhood anymore trash tumbling then settling on the curb i think i'd maybe um just to start, if I was doing that, I'd, I'd present tense it. Trash tumbles and settles on the curb. A car parked for months on the side of the street. Kickball until dark, ghostman on third. Thunder carves through midnight's quiet. A pile of glass where a car once was. Every storm tears down a tree limb or two, and a dog runs loose through the ruptured morning. This new sun unbearably light. Clouds in the shape of words we don't say anymore. Every day scabs over, sunsetting our memory. This is our language of letting go. Each moon is a moment, a secret that doesn't want to be a secret. You, know, um, you will pack a ba- small bag and almost leave for good this time, but you never do. Or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, Mark Grinier says to end it with a no. What do we do? Hmm. Yeah, so so that's the kind of thing I would do with with some kind of actual like leaning toward a conclusion at the end, you know, that remains as concrete as the rest of the poem without this sort of dancing around it. And I think the poem would be much more impactful that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we got to do the other poem. It's, it's past two. It's past the hour mark already. But but I, I love the details, and we had some interesting discussion about this poem. Let's see the, the other one. Um We'll get this down. Again, this is Patrick Wilcox. This is annotating my high school yearbook photo. Back of the sophomore class, back of the classroom every day, every half sleep and half angry and half starved and half confused and half into tilted smiling, 
fractured smiling into vacant faces and in loveless love with a halved person who will run your life if you let them. You will ruin, oops, ruin your life if you let them. You will ruin your life if you don't stop having. This is the photo your grandmother will keep in her purse until the winter she dies. Hair sprouting along your jaw, but your bedroom is a child's bedroom. You've halved your face with greasy bangs. You've halved your mind into dropping out of school. You stayed up until dawn, half anxious in your homemade entropy. This is the photo bookended by two friends, now and forever half alive and pill addicted. This is the photo taken before you would be found beaten, breathless, weightless, unwhole. This is the photo light is breaking in half again and again, a child of choices crackling toward what we want and need and hope to steal like starshine too soon halved by dawn. Yeah, and so um, so again, you can feel um, a bit of that same um, syntactic monotony, which only stands out because um, you know the lines are so strong um, that that they they have this sort of clear voice, but then when the voice repeats itself, it feels um, yeah, too many repetitions, as I heard said. So so it's sort of um, I think um, you know both these poems are sort of in love with repetition, and there's sort of two different types of rep there's two sort of flavors of the repetition but not enough breaking away at the right times. So, so the things thing applies. And again, if this is a high level um, criticism of the poem, because on, on a real close level or, uh, you know, more early on level in, in a writer's, um, you know, ability or whatever, um, the poem works great. I mean, it's great on the image and it's great on the, the detail and the sense of like being in the place and having a meaning, you know, it's all there. Um, but, um, but that's one thing. So, so watch your repetition. Don't fall too in love with repetition. Um, it's just sort of a general comment because it's, it's, an, it's a missed opportunity for one thing. Um, and it, it gives the poem more life to, to break the, you know, you set up a repetition, then you break it. Um, and don't be afraid to break it. Don't, don't fall too in love with the repetition. Anyway, annotating my high school yearbook photo. Back of the sophomore class, back of the classroom every day. Every day, half asleep and half angry and half starved and half confused and halved into tilted smiling. Uh, fractured smiling, the vacant faces, loveless love. And, and so there's a way that these are all um, these statements. Katie Dodger says, I think this would be stronger written in the first person, particularly as I feel set up for that level of closeness given the title. Um, and yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's one of the things, it's sort of these, these, um, Declarative statements, you know, which the last poem was too, you know, this re repetition of declarative statements without sort of entering it, for like these distanced declarations, and they, you know, and, that, and the poem, both poems sort of lay themselves out um, over and over again, um, and and so, you know, so bringing in a first person as a way to break that up and, and make it different, um, and, and feel a little more like natural speech, I guess, um, so. Um, um, Deb T says I like the title. It caught my interest. I was yeah, that's a great point. It's a great title. Annotating my high school yearbook photo. That's something that really makes you, you know, it's something we can relate to, but it's a, it's, it's specific enough because annotating um, that too, and we know we're looking back, so it really sets up perspective nicely. Um, you know, so if it was, um, you know. If we pulled in the eye, so every day I was half asleep and half angry and half starved, it would feel more personal and more connected. Um, another poet says, um, it should start at, this is the photo your mother will keep in her purse. I think it's a great start too, uh, right here. Annotating my high school yearbook photo. And if we cut rid of this stuff, which, which describes it some, um, Uh, but we don't, I don't know if we need it. What if we cut this? We'll just, we'll play with it for a second. Annotating my high school yearbook photo. This is the photo your grandmother will keep. Uh, and then as Kitty says, the, the my makes it stronger too. Let's just do it the way everyone's saying. And we'll see how it feels. This is the photo my grandmother will keep in her purse until the winter she dies. Hair sprouting from my jaw. Um, where am I? Hair sprouting from my jaw. But my bedroom is a child's bedroom. I've halved my face with greasy bangs. 
I have my mind dropping out of school. I've stayed up until dawn, half anxious, and my homemade entropy. This is the photo bookended by two friends now in forever half alive. Okay, I would be found beaten, breathless, weightless, unwhole. And this photo, light is breaking in half again. All right. I just wanted to do this. Okay, so now the poem just becomes much more personal. Um, annotating my high school yearbook photo. This is the photo my grandmother will keep in her purse until the winter she dies. Hair sprouting along my jaw, but my bedroom is a child's bedroom. Half my, I've halved my face with greasy bangs. I've halved, oops, sorry. I've had my mind into dropping out of school. I've stayed up until dawn, half anxious in my homemade entropy. This is the photo bookended by two friends, now and forever half alive and pilledicted. This is the photo taken before I would be found beaten, breathless, weightless, unwhole. In this photo, light is breaking in half again and again, a childhood of choices crackling toward what I want and need and hope to steal like starshine too soon halved by dawn. Um, yeah. And so, um, yeah, so I think the poem just works like this right now. I think that was just the edit. We, we cut out the beginning. So, you know, you were all great on the uh, Critique of the Week. Half, you know, cut off the ending, which was sort of spinning its wheels and getting too repetitive, going right into the photos, which we're describing a little bit in the detail. And then, um, and then, uh, and then, uh, yeah, and then, uh, then the first person making it feel more connected. I was just reading the uh, Katie also says to maybe cut the I've, you know, make it the um, what is it, the the past tense instead of the. Uh, Blue perfect? What what tense is that? When I have done this, yeah. Let, let's do it again because I think maybe Katie's onto something there too. Um, we'll get rid of those. It is kind of a cluttery way to say it, and it's a little more direct. Not, yeah. So um. Yeah, this is a photo my grandmother will keep in her purse until the winter she dies. Hair sprouting along my jaw, but my bedroom is a child's bedroom. I have my face with greasy bangs. I have my mind into dropping out of school. I stayed up until dawn, half anxious in my homemade entropy. Yeah. This is the photo bookended by two friends now and forever half alive and pill addicted. This is the photo taken before I would be found beaten, breathless, weightless, unwhole. This is the photo light is breaking in half again and again, a childhood of choices crackling toward what I want and need and hope to steal like starshine too soon halves by dawn. Um, what if we, um, and there is a, uh, yeah, I think the poem is great here. And the starshine too soon halves by dawn is a great last line. I love that. Um, so everything just stands out more by cutting and, and focusing on what really works with the poem. So it's a great... Um, the great point. There was one point that um, Rose Lenard makes. The poem is all about having, but the title doesn't make any connection with that idea. And um, and uh, and I, I wonder if you could do something with like like annotating half my high school yearbook photo, um, or um, cutting in half my high school yearbook photo. Something like that, where you can play with that. The the way having is is keep using, you know. Um, annotating half of my high school yearbook photos. Um, you know, just bring that in and having it be a twist on that a little bit might make the poem, you know, pop a little bit more from the title, which is already good. Um, yeah. So, um, and then one thing, other point out, um, SRH says I'd put grandmother later down. Uh, after hair, we could, you know, now that we're focusing, this really becomes a sequential list of, of photos, you know, in this photo, in this photo, in this photo. You know, literally, that's what the poem's doing. Uh, but we could switch, um, you know, away from the grandmother. Um, or we could switch the, the direction, too. So we could say, um, in this photo, my hair is sprouting along my jawline, jaw, but my bedroom is a child's bedroom. 
This is the photo. It's the photo my grandma will keep in her purse. So if you want to move your grandma down, you could do that. Um, yeah, and uh, Deb T says entertaining half my high school photo. Yeah, uh, I mean that works too. And it depends. I wonder if you could play with that a little bit. Rose Lenard says, but my bedroom is a child's bedroom. Do we need to repeat bedroom? You know, I almost did that a couple of times too, just as I was reading it. Um, you know, it just kind of gets a room. But my bedroom is a child's room. You know, I think that might be better just on a sound level. Ah, my critter suggests maybe my yearbook photo half remembered. So like my high school yearbook photo half remembered. So there's a lot of options. I think it'd be nice to put the half in there like that. Anyway, I think these are great. You know, these two edits that were all you <laughs> were great edits. I think really made the, the uh, poem sing, you know, so I think it's great. So with those edits, I think we, we can sort of fix this poem and it's totally uh, good to go. Um, so yeah, so great poems overall. Uh, thanks for sharing them, Patrick. They're really good. Uh, I appreciate um, you sharing them. Um, do keep an eye out for that repetition. You know, it's something that I think, you, you know, we can sort of fall in love with a certain um, strategy or, or sort of a go-to way of doing a poem. We do a little bit too much of it. And I think maybe that comes up here with those, you know, repetitions being a little bit too much. Um, you know, the half, you know, let me share another photo, a poem before we go. That's interesting, using this half, you know, in the different ways moving it and having the repetition of half. There's a poem that does this... Um, a lot that we published in Rattle, which just reminded me of, and why not? Why not share it? Um, who is it by? I have to remember. Yeah, it's called The Breaks by Kirk Robinson. And, and there's a way that, feel how we can use, again, some variation in this, um, but by using half over and over again. You know, we can propel the poem forward. This is Kirk Robinson, The Breaks. It's from Rattle number 35, so a good 12 years ago poem, The Breaks. Uh, here we go. Um, the Breaks, and then there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an epigram. And again, this is Kirk Robinson, The Breaks. To learn more about your new Kenmore washer, break the plastic seal from the manufacturer's instructions. That's the impetus for the poem, The Breaks. I have a friend who says, treat anything mechanical as if it's just about to break. I have a feeling brokenhearted. He's talking to himself in relation to his ex-wife, but I don't tell him that. She's called me, break the news, just before she left him. Breaking up was her phrase, as if we were all broken promise still in grade school. I'm leaving, she said, for good. I pictured him exactly where I knew he was at the time in mid scus breakneck on a mogul-filled downhill and veil. He wouldn't be back for two days and had no idea it would be to a broken home. And then, no note on the kitchen table or anywhere, no red box on the wall, break, in case of emergency, break glass. Two weeks later, we sat, line break, in front of a ridiculous amount of beer, I was trying at that point to explain to him that humans didn't invent weaving, breaking point, that it was an innovation of certain brightly colored, long-beaked birds, and when we stumbled upon the wonderful twisted nests, we figured them out by breaking them apart. Something in him broke loose, I guess. I'd been talking as if I could say anything groundbreaking about love. In retrospect, he probably should have broke my nose, but all he did was sit there for the first time, slumped over in a bar and cry. I looked everywhere, he said, for a note. Everywhere. He kept saying it. What's the word? What's the word for one of those great big weight crashing waves? And uh, and so, you know, that's a way that you can, you know, even if you want to push the poem even farther, um, could could play with the, the having even more. But that breaking and then not using the break at the end is a really powerful poem I always enjoyed. Uh, the, the sort of playfulness within a very serious topic that uh, Kirk Robinson does with that poem, The Breaks. And this poem reminded me of it. Um, and that last line, too, does somewhat of that same thing, where we have um, you know, it being had by dawn at the end. Anyway, there's a great poem by Patrick Wilcox. And then, uh, you know, great poems there. We also had a couple of poems by Bonnie Markowski, too, that were full of great details. So really wonderful poems to share this week. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. And thanks for your comments. Uh, you know, the group uh, here that helps critique these poems is just wonderful. And um, 
you know, all the comments here are really worth uh, looking at. If, you, if I didn't read any of them, they're still uh, excellent. So thanks for being here and sharing everything. It's a lot of fun. Now, this week's guest in the Rattlecast, I'm going to say, uh, is going to be a slight transition. So we have, um, uh, oops, I didn't even do it. See, Bob Hickok was supposed to be the guest. And I got to fill it in because Bob has a, had a family emergency and had to reschedule. So we're going to do him later in the fall. And instead, um, very graciously, um, there we go. Linda Heckman Ayers agreed to move up and fill in for him. So Linda Heckman Ayers is going to be the guest this week, Monday, September 11th. Uh, her newest book is Overture. She has three books being published uh, in, over, in the space of a year. So um, uh, Overtures is one of them. The other one is... Um, that's already out is when all else fails. And then she's got a third that's coming out in the, in the spring, but we decided to do the show now and maybe have her back for that third book. Cause she's got so much work coming out. She's done tons for poetry. She has a great newsletter. Um, a really wonderful poet dedicated to the craft. Uh, that's Lana Heckman Ayers, Monday, September 11th. The prompt for this week, uh, was to write a one sentence poem. Um, after, uh, that includes one truth. No, Two truths and one lie. That's right. A one-sentence poem that includes two truths and one lie. Last week's guest, uh, Elizabeth McMoon to Tango, um, co-edits that journal um, one-sentence poem. So we wanted a one-sentencer, and that's the uh, that's the prompt we got. So a one-sentence poem with two truths and one lie. That'll be Rattlecast 210 with Lana Hexman airs Monday night, September 11th, regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great weekend in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Goodbye.